Hi everyone who's already on the line. We will be starting in a few minutes. Just waiting for more people to log on. Okay, great. I think we can start. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Anna Lemström, and I work as a business development manager at Southpol in Helsinki in Finland. Uh, and uh, I'm one of the organizers of the Nordic platform, uh, Mobilizing Climate Finance. And we are delighted to have so many people attending today on this third webinar of our corporate webinar series. Uh, today we are here to discuss the very topical subject of climate risks, both physical and transitional. And we are delighted to yet again be able to host such a prominent panel of speakers around uh, today's subject. Uh, but before we jump into the topic of today, I will go through some practicalities and say a few words on the platform itself. So great that all of you who have now logged in uh, were able to do so. Your default audio setting is now mute while joining. But if you have any questions, you can answer ask them through the question box uh, at any time of the webinar. Uh, we will uh, try to resolve technical questions uh, as soon as possible and topic related questions we will uh, then uh, talk, uh, talk about in the discussion part, the Q&A session in the end. And please bear, it, bear with us that when some of us might be broadcasting from our homes due to the current situation, uh, in case there's any sound or technical issues, hope hope you trust that we are doing the best we can and this uh, webinar will be recorded and uh, we will aim to end it at around uh, half past 11 central european time but we're a bit flexible here depending on how much discussion there will be and how long our panelists might want to stay on today um, but yes, to the platform uh, itself, then um, uh, the Nordic platform for mobilizing climate finance is coordinated by South Pole under the auspices of uh, Nordic Council of Ministries. And the background to this uh, initiative is the Helsinki principles that promote national climate action, especially through fiscal policy and the use of public finance and also the Nordic Vision 2030 and its strong focus on climate action. Uh, but the ultimate goal of the platform is to highlight uh, areas where Nordic cooperation within the Nordic Council of Ministries can support the road towards climate neutrality. And the platform is doing this by hosting this series of webinars, followed by a workshop where corporates and financial institutions can share their experiences and challenges and provide an inspiration towards each other uh, and other actors in this community. And in the end, all of this will also distill into recommendations for the Nordic governments. 
And this is the third and last webinar in this corporate series. In parallel, there is also a series of webinars for the financial sector. Maybe some of you have attended those as well. The last one will be next week in that series. But now let's move on to the actual subject of today. Uh, we will start with Nico Krenner from South Pole, our leading experts in climate risks, who will give us an introduction to the topic. Uh, after this, uh, our first business case of today will be presented by uh, the risk manager of Fiskars Group, Johanna Roine, who is here also. Uh, after this, uh, uh, Matti Kahra from ECO, the Confederation of Finnish Industries, will give us an introduction to how Finnish businesses are preparing for climate-related risks and Matti is also here, <laughs> and uh, in the end we will hear Kim Hellström, the strategy lead at H&M Group, tell us about their work. And yes, Matti is also, uh, oh, I mean Kim is also here, maybe he switched on the camera, I'm not sure, but yes, uh, welcome Nico. Thank you Anna, and also a uh, very welcome from my side. We're looking forward to this webinar, and um, I don't want to keep you too long from the presentation of our uh, of our three panelists, but just provide you a brief uh, introduction into transition risks and and physical risks. Maybe over the next next uh, five minutes, really uh, answering the questions: What are transition and physical risks? If you're not already really familiar with it, um, why should we care, and uh, how can we address these these issues? And starting with the question, what are physical and transition risks? As Anna already said, they are normally uh, thought of as climate risks so related to uh, climate change, related to um, the greenhouse gas um, pollution that we as a whole, as a, as a community, as an economy produce. And then if we speak about physical and transition risks, they are kind of looking at two sides of the coin. So I use this, this picture from the IPCC to, to briefly uh, introduce these concepts with this. On the left side, you can kind of see the physical risks, which means business are impacted by climate change, meaning uh, when, when greenhouse gas concentrations go up three to four times comparison to pre-industrial levels, we have more heat waves, changes in rainfall patterns, uh, sea level rise, and so forth. And of course, this will have uh, disrupting impacts on, on our business. Then if you look on the right side of the picture, this is more speaking about how business are impacted by policy changes, right? So if you want to um, prevent disastrous climate change from happening, we will need to have um, certain changes in the way our economy is functioning, and this will always come. It's only possible to come together with certain policy changes. And of course, these uh, may present certain transitional risks or risks from, from moving to this net zero economy. Of course, they also um, are a big um, opportunity for, for several businesses. And because this is, of course, not only affecting one business uh, in its own, but also its supply chain, its uh, its customers, and finally the whole financial market. That's why um, TCFD was finally forced, so the Task Force for Climate Related Disclosure, which I uh, want quickly to discuss on the next slide. So the TCFD framework kind of released in 2017, the task force kind of coming from the task force for climate uh, related financial disclosure um, really had in mind that these risk opportunities can be so large is one of the biggest issues that we face over the next 20 30 years that they can um, endanger the financial stability uh, of all the financial markets and that's why we need to have greater transparency within the market on these different risk opportunities and especially how different business are uh, addressing these issues of course it's not completely new concept within CDP, for example, you already had certain questions and then climate was already a really important issue. The kind of step forward that came with TCFD was really introducing the concept of scenario analysis, uh, because um, as we all know, if you go 20 to 30 years, even in the future, it, everything becomes very uncertain, right? That's why TCFD introduced the concept of scenario analysis to be able to cope with these large uncertainties if we do uh, future assessment of risk opportunities. Further, there was really a strong input 
uh, strong focus put on, on quantific quantification of the business impact to so give some way of a, of a financial measure. And then as a long-term goal, at some point kind of mainstreaming this information into financial statements. Overall, the TCFD framework is built on four different pillars, kind of uh, addressing governance issues, risk management strategy, and then finally going down to, to metrics and targets. And uh, so far, 1,440 organizations um, support the TCF theme framework with 12.6 trillion um, of, uh, of money kind of staying behind these, these organizations. But uh, why should we care? What is the business case for an individual business? Um, we divided it a bit into three uh, main topics that are the blue ones, which is really kind of internal business uh, management and internal processes that can really profit from uh, addressing uh, TCFD and climate risk opportunities, which is one focusing on effective mitigation adaptation, right? To be effective, to doing effective mitigation adaptation, one needs to have an idea on the on the scale of the transition and physical risk and opportunities to be really able to funnel money in the in the right direction when we speak about mitigation adaptation options and actions. And it can go through improving resilience through the su supply chain, right? Working with your suppliers on uh, pre preventing uh, the collapse of the supply chain during certain hazardous events, reducing the exposure to to fossil fuels. Um, or even preparing for a carbon price, for example. But then also really important, of course, is the thing about the opportunities, seizing opportunities that are coming along with, with climate change and our res uh, response to it. That may just be um, access to the financial markets because there is a certain disclosure done and there is a certain pressure from the financial market to go into the direction of um, uh, addressing uh, climate risks. Being able to, to report on that can really make access to the financial markets easier. Of course, there will be new markets developing, there will be new technologies developing, everything that can um, provide opportunities uh, for a business in the future. And the last thing is more kind of from an outside perspective is really maintain credibility. So with this big issue and with climate change becoming more and more in the mind of everyone, I think it's important that a business can show, yes, I'm taking this issue seriously and I'm preparing four different scenarios that might happen into the future. And this, of course, goes along with being able to report to CDP, to the George Jones Sustainability Index. Even the French government um, has a law where you are required to, to uh, disclose on certain uh, aspects uh, of climate risks. So I think these are really the compelling reasons why this is so interesting now. Let us speak about um, how you can do that. And uh, just quickly want to show you how uh, we at South Pole developed a service to address um, these issues. <clears throat> Starting with uh, a gap analysis, we need to go and start to come into the topic. It's really important to make first, get an idea where do I stand in comparison to what can I do in terms of governance, in terms of strategy, in terms of risk management, and in terms of metrics and targets. And with this start status quo to really have a good foundation to start uh, on the journey to uh, get better aware of climate risk and opportunities. The next step, and that's to be the biggest one, is climate scenario analysis, where you really go into the details, take different scenarios from, from the scientific community, from um, the energy, energy, International Energy Agency, for example, and, and work with these scenarios to understand better what could be different types of risk opportunities specific for for your company in the future. And then as a next step, and this is really when, when you're thinking of integrating this information into uh, internal risk management processes, we can also support in doing that. And then as a last step, uh, of course, it's important to then be able to speak about it, to be able to speak about the things that were learned during this process internally. So um, to prepare then a CDP or TCFD aligned uh, reporting. And I think with this uh, short introduction to the overall topic, I'm really happy um, to hand over uh, to our first speaker, which is Johanna from, from Fiskars Group. Hello, can you hear and see me? 
Yes, we can hear you and see you well. Great, great. So good day, everyone. My name is Johanna Roine and I work as the risk manager for Fiscus Group. And today online with me is also our expert on sustainability, our sustainability manager, Nina Niemela, and she will help me to answer, answer all your tough questions. But first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be, to be part of the South Pole webinar. We are really excited about the topic and the presentations. So next slide. Uh, briefly on the agenda, so we are going to very briefly introduce Fiscus Group, which can be a difficult due to almost 400 years of history. However, the focus will be more on the sustainability actions and the actual process of assessing climate risks. So next slide. Um, at Fiscus Group, our actions are defined by our purpose of making the everyday extraordinary. The everyday is different for everyone. Therefore, our aim is to bring together different people and ways of thinking to learn, explore and create. And, well, simply make those memorable everyday moments. So, in the next slide. Uh, our journey started over 370 years ago, and ever since we have truly been part of the everyday uh, of our consumers. So our main categories consist of tableware, cooking, interior and lifestyle, school and office equipment, gardening and outdoor products. So we are all over the place. So throughout these years, Fiscus has held on key principles that has made us the oldest still operating company in Finland. And the principles of uh, the principles of high quality, lasting design and superior craftsmanship form a large basis of our sustainability strategy and our efforts. So, yes. So we have indeed come a long way from a local Finnish iron shop to a global company of over 7,000 employees operating in, in over 30 countries. Uh, some of our products are very recognizable around the world and many of them have won uh, several design prizes. Uh, due to the high, 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 high and lasting, lasting quality, it is very common that generations pass the products to the next ones. Even I have uh, several beautiful design items that I have received from my beloved grandmother. So quickly in the next slide, uh, here are our brands that make us who we are today. Um, if you look closely, you might see that under some of the logos, there is a founding date. So some of these brands are indeed hundreds of years old. Uh, with this heritage and history, we have a great responsibility to make the everyday extraordinary for the next 300 years. Uh, and in the Fiscus Group, we understand that climate change is one of the most pervasive and threatening global issues and every organization has a responsibility to, to act proactively. So that was about Fiscus, and now we are going to focus more on the sustainability efforts and actions. So sustainability at Fiscus Group truly sits at the heart of our purpose and values. Our vision of creating a positive, lasting impact on the quality of life well, it cannot be fulfilled if sustainability is not integrated into everything what we do. Um, we have committed, communicated and agreed on three key sustainability commitments. These commitments are guided by our vision and are it's inspired by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So firstly, uh, the circular products and design. Uh, the goal is to create zero waste. We continue to design for sustainability and explore service models around circularity. Uh, an example is our take back vintage service where our consumers are encouraged to recycle their old tableware in return for a voucher of, for our store. We also continuously research alternative ways of using uh, leftover glass and other, other materials to make recycled products. Uh, even our very iconic orange handle scissors experienced a recycled makeover when we collaborated with the World Wildlife Fund for supporting the biodiversity of nature. Um, carbon neutral business is probably the area of the biggest impact on climate. 
uh, we continue to seek alternative ways of improving our energy efficiency and growingly invest in renewable energy sources. Recently, we have focused also on our value chains and researched uh, kind of ways of reducing emissions there. And with the through positive impact, we aim to, first of all, increase awareness, inspire people through leadership and continue on being the champion of safety, diversity and inclusion. Overall, the goal is to do no harm, instead aim for the good. So the next slide, um, actually like earlier this month, we announced our approved science-based targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in line with the Paris Agreement, which is to pursue efforts to limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 Celsius. The setting of the science-based targets is, is, is definitely uh, one step forward in the journey towards a carbon neutral business. Uh, for, for example, we aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our own operations. Uh, and we look at our transportation and distribution, but also we pay attention to our suppliers. And, and our goal is that most of them would have their own science-based targets in place. Uh, next slide. So every year we participate in this uh, carbon disclosure program. So CDP is a global non-profit organization that provides a system to measure, disclose and manage vital climate related information. This year we reached A- rating for our climate actions. And in a way, it's a good that there is this small minus from the best A rating because it reminds us that committing to a positive climate action is indeed a continuous effort and there is still so many ways to do that. So now to the actual uh, area of assessing the climate threats, and this will be a very high level. Of course, we do a very, very, very extensive and detailed assessment as well. but. Assessing climate risk is a critical step uh, and first of all we want to build awareness in the organization regarding the kind of climate uh, issues that we are, we are uh, facing but we want to understand our context, our impact to the climate change and the impact of the climate change to our business. So as said before, uh, we have a great responsibility to be part of the solution in a fight against climate change. So here is the big picture on how we assess the climate risks in the in Fiscus Group. Uh, it all starts setting the mandate commitment uh, and the overall right top from the top management, meaning the board and our leadership team. And without this, it is of course difficult to drive change, changes for better. We apply a company-wide risk, uh, risk management approach meaning that climate risks are integrated into company-wide risk, risk identification, assessment and management process. This helps us gain consolidated data across the group and kind of view the climate-related risk from the different perspectives of uh, our business areas and different functions. One of our risk, risk management principles is to monitor and continuously improve our risk management process and to report key risks internally and externally. Uh, it might sound as a cliche, but transparency is truly at the core of this because we want to stay true to our actions and, and communicate them fairly. Uh, we frequently research the key stakeholder insights and expectation and this di dialogue between us and the stakeholders is really important because it not only it guides our decision distances and but it helps us confirm that we are on a right pa path with our our actions against the climate change. Uh, our own operations probably the biggest part uh, co covers areas such as manufacturing, distribution and such, uh, they assess in detail their local risk and conduct impact assessment according to standards and systems. They have the great responsibility to create the actual development plans and when required they implement the actions in place. So that's where the change happens. Um, yeah, so next slide. 
So we we have identified we conduct like a yearly risk assessments with our functions but uh, here are some like really high level kind of climate related drivers and uh, we want to view this just like a coin that these drivers have two sides the risk and the opportunity so firstly uh, as a retail company consumer behavior is the most important driver and failing to meet the consumer expectations regarding climate change related actions could lead to decrease in consumer confidence and of course decrease in revenues because well consumers would simply likely are likely to support those who act accordingly luckily the opportunity side is a huge uh, and forms a large part of our current strategy so we seek growth through innovations and climate positive actions, for example, around circularity, new product design and such. Regulations and own operations uh, costs are likely to increase due to regulations of using fossil materials and fuels. Uh, making the right adjustments to our own operating models, uh, well, to be honest, it can be very challenging and, and very costly. Therefore, the opportunity is to proactively use alternative sources of clean energy from a business perspective. Uh, from a business perspective, uh, there are also savings potentials through tax advantages, incentives and other pricing benefits. So it pays, uh, pays, pays off to be kind of green in this area, definitely. So reputation big one highly related to consumer behavior but overall failing to meet expectations of our key stake stakeholders not only affect our performance but could lead to rep reputational damage and therefore we want to act proactively listen to our stakeholders and respond accordingly uh, natural hazards uh, of course a big big physical risk for us because we are a very global company operating in in several areas that could be impacted by the cyclones earthquakes landslides and such and it, it can be said that these natural hazards are constantly increasing uh, so the risk is that we we um, we might experience some business interruptions but opportunity for us is, of course, to, to, to not only to use kind of a transition of the risk, but, but to, to make, to, to do our best effort in the fight against the climate change. But that was all for Fiskas Group and looking forward for the next presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. Really nice uh, presentation. If I may, uh, just because we have a question Q&A later, but just uh, quickly, some question uh, came into our mind before we jump to, to Mati in the next presentation was, you mentioned uh, the stakeholder process. Um, and I think, especially with your company being so widely distributed all around the world, having so many stakeholders, do you, can you share any experience or, or hints on how to get all these different people and their views and connect them for, for such a process? Yep, I would actually give this this chance to uh, for Nina Niemela to answer because I believe that she is the one who has been uh, holding this kind of questionnaire to our key stakeholders. Sure. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Good question, but a little bit tricky one. But because of course, <laughs> managing all different stakeholder expectations, it's not very easy, and of course, we also have very many different channels uh, where we communicate with the stakeholders. So for example, to our consumers, um, we have some surveys where we collect their ideas and their expectations on sustainability. And then uh, for example, investors, we have at least annual meetings with them where we discuss about their uh, expectations on on the climate issues and then what else could i erase as an example and well, definitely yes. we have like an internal stakeholder assessment as well and i i, I find personally mm -hmm. i find that very important as well yes yes good point and also customers they are expecting more and more 
on our our climate action and we actually just interviewed um, 25 of our biggest customers all, all around the globe and mm -hmm. it was really interesting to hear their climate work and their expectations mm -hmm. to us and they were pretty much well aligned so very yeah. many ways to collect the <laughs> expectations thank you yeah i know it's uh, especially the stakeholder management is a big a big uh, issue and it's not easy to solve but i think you you found a really good way to move that forward um with that yeah thanks for this presentation and for sure we will come back with more questions uh during the q a but for now let's uh, move forward to to mati and looking forward to in your presentation thank you thank you nico and and, and thank you johanna for the presentation. So uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Also from from my side, my name is Matti Kahra. I work as a a chief policy advisor here at the Confederation of of Finnish Industries, and I will be talking to you today about the work we've been doing uh, in the Confederation in terms of 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 climate risks and opportunities, and more specifically about the report that we released earlier this year on looking at uh, the impact of climate change on Finnish business and, and how we, how our members and our companies view uh, transition, uh, physical and transition risks uh, re related to climate change. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, for those of you, probably many of you know the Confederation of Finnish Industries, but for those of you who don't, just a, a, a brief introduction. So we are the, the leading business organization here in Finland. Um, for many of, of the people in the Nordics, so our sister organizations are Svensk Nærenslivet in, in Sweden, Dansk Industri in, in Denmark and NHO in, in Norway. So we represent around 70% of, of of the private sector jobs here in Finland, uh, two thirds of, of the GDP created by companies and also a, a significant share of the R&D expenditure and, and the export exports of Finland. So our members consist from, uh, from all of the sectors uh, starting from finance to energy in the intensive industries, all the way to retails, textiles and fashion. So all of the, the major major industries in Finland, uh, excluding the, the forest industry. So we have a quite broad base of, of companies uh, from different sectors. And this is specifically uh, interesting in terms of, of climate change and looking at different impacts and opportunities uh, that it brings. Next slide, please. So uh, we are still having <laughs> maybe not in Europe so much, but in, in many countries at least, uh, a lot of discussion on how climate change will impact companies uh, and whether it is something that needs to be uh, considered when, when companies are, are looking at their own business. And, and I like this quote from, from Mark Carney, who is currently the United Nations Special Envoy, Envoy for Climate Change and previous governor of the Bank of England, who has said uh, that, that this is not a question of, of whether climate change will impact your company, but how it will impact. So companies that fail to respond to climate change, they will go bankrupt without question. And this comes back to the fact that even though maybe if your company is not impacted of, of the transition to, to a low carbon e economy, but we will most most definitely be impacted at least with, with the physical damage and, and changes that will occur when, when the climate is getting warmer. So we're not talking about a world anymore where this is a question of if, but this is a, a question of how and when and, and, and how companies should really uh, think about their own business in terms of a very rapidly changing uh, environment as well. Next slide, please. So uh, in 2018, the Confederation of Finnish Industries, we set out a, a, a commitment that we are committed to the 1.5 degree uh, target under the Paris Agreement. Um, this was due to many reasons, but, but one of the, the big reasons is, was also that we saw the, the, the increasing discussion around net zero targets, both in, in Finland and in the European Union. And actually, a year after our commitment, both in Finland, uh, the Finnish government uh, set a carbon neutrality target 
for 2035 and and a little after that we also saw the the adoption of a net zero target for for the European Union by 2050 and if you've been following the news lately we've actually seen a quite a rapid increase also of, of net zero targets coming specifically from Southeast uh, Asia where where China uh, Japan South Korea and other countries have also set net zero targets so we are seeing a quite a rapid um, deployment of net zero targets around the world and we at the confederation we really be, believe that this is a huge opportunity for Finnish businesses so the, the the low carbon transformation that we're going to see is going to require a massive amount of investments and new growth opportunities for companies both in existing technology and, and new solutions and in the European Union alone there is an estimate by the, the Commission that the additional investments that will yearly investments that we need to make in order to reach this net zero target will be in the order of, of, of hundreds of billions of euros per year so we're talking about a massive uh, increase in investment and, and growth in the low carbon sectors uh, and, and the following uh, jobs and opportunities that will arise from this. So we really see this is an opportunity and, 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 a, and a good way to go. Um, in terms of looking at the actual mitigation pathways and what, this, what does it mean for Finnish companies, we've, um, all of our business sectors released these so-called low carbon roadmaps which we did together with the, with the Finnish government and the ministries and those these were released in June. So we were looking at the pathways and the technology and investment needs that will be needed to take place in Finland and Europe to, to reach these targets. Uh, because of the fact that Finland is one of the leading uh, clean tech innovation countries, we really believe that there is a huge opportunity for Finnish businesses, not only when to reaching these targets, but also growing our, our uh, carbon handprint and, and the growth opportunities that will arise from, from this transformation all around the world. Next slide, please. So now specifically to the report that we did uh, uh, and released uh, in January of this year. So based on the little bit of the background on, on why we uh, decided to do this work. As I said that after our commitment two years ago to, to the 1.5 degree target, we really started thinking about more specifically on, on what will be the actual operating environment and how the world will change when, uh, when, when we are uh, looking at a, a net zero world of, of 1.5 degrees, but also the risks of, of not reaching those targets. So we we also realize the fact that this is something that even though the European Union itself would, which would reach the net zero by 2050 and would be on a 1.5 degree pathway, we would still have the question of, of adaptation and, um, and ad adapting to a warmer, warmer world. And, and this was the reason that we chose the TCFD framework. So we were looking at the physical risks and the transition risks and, and did a scenario analysis where we were trying to sort of look at the two different extremes of, of what will happen when when the world will reach this 1.5 degree target and, and if you fail to, to reach that what will be the mitigation and adaptation needs in, in those different extremes. Uh, it is quite clear from from based on the findings of our report uh, that, that all of these risks uh, are very complex they are very they are non-linear and they're they're highly inter interdependent. So it is also a very complex world that we and complex questions with, that we are working with. But there are some very common uh, some common nominators in all of these scenarios, and that gave us also confidence in really trying to understand and looking at what will be the next steps that we need to take, regardless of the warming scenario or the or the mitigation uh, pathway that the world is going to take. Uh, many of our members and our companies, especially the the bigger the the companies which have a global presence, like Fiskars, for example, have already done a lot, of, quite a lot of work on their own. But we also have a 96% of our members are are SMEs, so small and medium-sized enterprises. And the the idea through this study was really to provide some concrete tools 
some concrete quantification and understanding on what kind of changes there will be in different continents around the world and how this will impact Finnish companies. Um, so we mostly focused on, on different continent, continents and also the cross-border impacts and specifically as Finland is an and um, um, we are an export-oriented country. We're also, also looking at the role of regulation and trade policy and, and, look, and, and trying to analyze different uh, pathways that this will take. We chose uh, 2050 as our, our, our endpoint because most of the, the changes, whether it be from these mitigation and adaptation pathways, will be relevant and, and um, visible by then especially if you're looking at uh, companies in the energy in the intensive industries, which are looking at investment cycles of, of, of decades uh, long. Um, next slide, please. So just uh, the, the report itself is over a, uh, almost 100 pages long, and there's quite a lot of stuff in it. So I really urge you to, to take a look at it more, more deeply, but just very briefly, five key points that we um, that we we discovered through this work. So, as I mentioned, that our members are come from different industries and different backgrounds, and and there is quite a big difference in terms of of what will be the actual effects of of and the risk of whether we'd be talking about physical transition risk based on on the business sector that you're working with. One of the key findings was that, especially when we're talking about physical risks, Finnish industry is heavily impacted by, by the changes that the a warming climate and all of the, the damages and risks that will break. And this is due to the fact that at most of our um, industry is working in global value chains and, and climate change will uh, affect both the raw, raw materials logistics routes and the location of, of, of production around the world. In terms of, of transition risks, there are, there are many of them, but what we found, what, what are the most relevant for Finnish industries is, is the fact that we're, the regulatory landscape is changing very fast. As I, I mentioned about the, the net zero targets around the world, but we also have uh, quite a lot of questions on how the regulatory landscape will develop, for example, in the US uh, with the upcoming election. Uh, there are big changes in the in technology, not just uh, would be talking about the energy sector quite a lot and the, the rise and rise of, of renewable energy and the, the very low cost of producing it, but also in terms of, of transport, electrification of transport, uh, electrification of industry and, and so on. Uh, one big factor that will also affect Europe quite a lot is, is the question of climate migration and, and what will happen in, in Africa, for example, in the coming decades. Uh, we will put quite significant pressure on for in Europe uh, in terms of, of, of the migration. And, and through that also the question of, of skilled labor as well. Uh, one thing we, we found and is also the fact that uh, by acting proactively and having this uh, done, we can also make Finland and Finnish companies more attractive investments. So for providing these, this outlook and, and looking at the ways in how the 1.5 degree and net zero targets will affect, affect um, Finnish companies, we can also use this as a, as a very big investment opportunity. And lastly, the biggest question I think, and in terms of, for example, the, the uh, carbon border adjustment discussion, which is going on over now in Europe, there will be big changes that climate policy will affect trade and geopolitics, and, and this will have significant implications for, for Finland, as well as for other European countries. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I have here the, the links to the, the full report. Uh, but I just want to, to close up with, with four key points. So as I mentioned that for the Confederation of Finnish Industries, we are really looking at four different steps on how we look at uh, responding to climate change and trying to reap the benefits. So we have 
We have set our ambitious science-based targets and all of our members are committed to that. We have created these sector-specific roadmaps in trying to analyze on what will be the pathways that will take us there. We have tried to um, properly analyze the climate risks and opportunities and provide clarity to, to Finnish uh, politicians and investors and stakeholders on what will be the changes that will occur. Uh, we are publicly updating our progress and engaging with our stakeholders to really try to understand together or how these changes will impact the Finnish and, and European society. And, and lastly, and I think most importantly, is the fact that we have committed to driving this change and, and we have also committed to being a responsible policy, policy um, in responsible policy engagement. So we have top level commitment on that everything that we do and, and everything we act is, is reflected uh, through our, our ambitious uh, climate targets and, and the way we operate. So here is my presentation. I'll be happy to, to take your comments and questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mati. Uh, really interesting presentation. And that uh, kind of burns me, you know, my nails to go into the details of the scenario analysis and then really inquire more of it. But I, for now, we'll restrain from that and just uh, ask you a bit more of a high level question. That is, when we speak about policy and all of the Nordic governments, did you also look at how the Nordic governments could kind of support uh, Finnish business or what would their role be in, in kind of helping move along this agenda? Yes, definitely. I think I, we are in a very um, good situation in the sense that, especially in, in terms of, of our Nordic partners, whether it be the, the, the confederation of industries with Nordic countries, and also the Nordic governments, we have very clo close cooperation. And, and Anna mentioned these Helsinki principles in, in the beginning. So we have very close dialogue with, with not just the Finnish government, but also other Nordic governments uh, in terms of, of cooperation. And, and for example, very concretely on looking at mm -hmm. the, the changes that are needed in the, for example, the Nordic uh, energy market and the Nordic, Nordic energy regulation on, because the electricity market is, is, is Nordic. So we have to work together then to find the best ways. Uh, now we're expanding that cooperation to, to, to CCS and CCU, uh, transport and so on. So that's a very big part of, of, of the discussions and the dialogue, uh, both in terms of, of making the politicians understand what kind of regulatory changes there will be needed and how, how do, can they best support the, the operating environment. But I think also to have a Nordic point of view when we're talking about the wider EU climate and energy policy and legislation, because like I mentioned, in terms of the energy and electricity markets, for example, the Nordics can really set a, have, have set a good standard on how to do this cooperation uh, between countries and what kind of a, an electricity market uh, setup you can, for example, have, which supports this low carbon development and, and the penetration of renewables into the system. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it's really an, an interesting topic and I, I think it would be also nice to now give the, all of our listeners the chance to to contribute to this to this webinar in terms of I would like to make a, a, a short poll on this question so now for you uh, listening what's your opinion on is there a role for Nordic governments to streamline and standardize climate risk assessments be for you to take a second to think about it and provide your your opinion on that Perfect. I think with that, happy to to uh, hand over to to Anna to maybe have a look at the at the results and uh, a bit of further discussion. Yes. Hello again. Uh, 
sorry, I'm <laughs> just having some technical issues here. Uh, yes, but we have, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. I cannot find a slide. I think if you close the poll, I would see the slides again, right? Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, and yes, so you can move one slide forward. So we asked you some questions when you were registering to this webinar as well. And we asked you if there is a role for Nordic governments to facilitate high quality climate risk data for corporate supply chains. And as you can see here from this graph, most of you have answered yes, if governments facilitate open source high quality climate data, corporates are better equipped to set targets. Then there's about 20% answering that there might be. And uh, also a few of you think there isn't a, a role for governments to do this. But thank you anyway for answering and this is interesting information. Uh, and now I would have one more task for you. In addition to uh, knowledge sharing, the platform aims to collect feedback on how governments can support the private sector in overall transitions to net zero. And now we would like to know if you have any ideas of what this role is according to you in general. So please, if you could still answer uh, this question uh, in the question box, the answers will then be reported to the Nordic governments and uh, they will gather this, we will gather this information for them. Uh, but yes, uh, you have now some time to do so or during our next presentation, which will be given by Kim. Uh, welcome, Kim. Hi there. Can you all hear me? Okay. Or can someone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, great. Thank you for listening in. My name is Kim Hellström and I'm responsible for the H&M Group's long-term climate uh, strategies. I'm based in, in Stockholm and uh, my climate team is a part of the uh, Global Sustainability Department. Uh, currently consisting of about 270 sustainability resources, both experts and uh, generalists. Next, please. Some quick facts. We have about uh, 5,000 stores in uh, 74 markets. Sales are about 230 billions and we employ around 174,000 people. Next, please. These are our current brands. We have H&M, of course. We have COS, uh, Weekday, Monkey, H&M Home, and other stories, Arket, and Afound. Each one focusing on a specific part of the fashion market and each one with their unique uh, DNA. All brands are of course supported by and developed through our backbone and our infrastructure. Uh, we continue also to do investments in companies that support our long-term goals such as, for example, sustainable raw material producer called Renew Cell uh, with their circulose material. And of course, we also, we are majority owner in the resale platform Selfie that we're now expanding uh, strongly. We have our own investment branch of the company constantly looking for future opportunities where we can be a part of creating a positive impact. We are convinced that a growing part of our future revenue will come from new business models. And we want to use our size uh, and scale to push for transition away from fossil fuel uh, towards a circular and fashion, a circular fashion industry. Important to mention also is that we we don't do not have any kind of production of our own, and we source everything from external suppliers. Next. Uh, a quick look at our H&M Group sustainability vision. We want to lead the change in our industry through promoting and scaling innovation, supporting entrepreneurs and uh, uh, to, to, to get ahead in, in their relevant field. Transparency is something that we consider ourselves to be leaders in, which is also confirmed by many others. But of course, we want to do much more and it will be increasingly important with transparency going forward to maintain credibility in, uh, in the dialogue, in the discussion around uh, um, 
climate ambitions and climate performance. In regards to climate ambitions, uh, without credibility, you really have nothing and you run the risk of approaching different types of greenwashing. We need stronger and more automatic tools for incentivizing our suppliers, but also uh, internally with our staff, of course. Uh, putting a price on uh, emissions and highlighting where the important decisions are made so that we can start impacting where, where internally we are taking decisions that it has an impact on future emissions. With this, within Circle and Climate Positive, we need to develop our whole value chain, starting with our supply chain, but not stopping there. Influence those around us, both inside and outside our industry. We need to increase the pace towards full circularity, lowering the use of virgin material across all our brands. And this closely connects also to our biodiversity ambition, which was recently launched together with the WWF. And of course, we need to change how our products are manufactured. That's the big thing. We must support our suppliers to transition away from fossil fuels. Next. In April 2017, we started communicating that our aim for uh, becoming climate positive had, had been uh, or it uh, had been released. Uh, becoming climate positive no later than 2040 by reducing more CO2 than what our whole value chain emits. What was new back then was that we included everything from energy usage for raw material production, such as diesel in the farmers' machinery on, the, on, the, on their land, and all the way to the other end where, where the customers are using electricity to wash and dry and uh, iron our garments or our products. We did not know how to achieve this, but what we knew is we needed to do this fully hearted if it were supposed to be ambitious in the long term. Nowadays, not including your full scope three in your company's climate ambition would it be impossible for any company that uh, hopes to, uh, to, to call themselves ambitious. There has been an ever growing number of claims, as you probably know, ambitions and pledges, with different terms such as climate neutral, carbon neutral, carbon positive, carbon negative, lifetime carbon neutral, net zero, or, or whatever you can find. Uh, we are aiming to get a globally accepted definition of the term climate positive. We want it to be a definition that consumers can trust. We want it to be the most ambitious and far reaching alternative available for any company. It's not uh, uh, tailored for us. We don't know if it's going if we ourselves is going to make it, but that's not the point. It has to be the most ambitious uh, term. Um, and we're doing this together with WWF and IKEA that shares our visions here. We want to have a science-based approach to reductions, and we are avoiding uh, offsetting, and especially we're avoiding false claims towards consumers. That's a big one for us. So our guiding principle is aiming to follow the carbon law by reducing 50% of our emissions every decade. And of course, follow the rules of the science-based target initiative. We know that we have uh, to do some kind of compensatory activities for certain unavoidable emissions, but we will not, uh, or we will only accept a very high quality for this. And most probably therefore, nothing that is cheaper than actually reducing emissions uh, reach uh, getting to the core of the problems instead of compensating for it thereby steering our resources correctly towards further reductions next so we did a risk analysis based on the tcfd methodology focusing on our climate emergency and how it will impact our future possibilities to be a successful company Four areas were identified, increased price of raw material, especially cotton, uh, which is a very needy crop, it's not, it needs a lot of land and a lot of water. Uh, it becomes more and more difficult to grow it in certain places and it can be moved to a, a number of times, but at some point it will start competing with food and then it will be a very difficult dis uh, discussion. So that is strengthening our ambition to quickly get away from this linear uh, business model and into a fully circular business model where we're not using virgin material. Number two is production. We see in some areas of the 
planet, securing workforce is becoming more difficult. Some regions of India has, uh, are seeing temperatures of 50 degrees, making it difficult to work, making it difficult to live and to stay hydrated. And that, of course, is uh, um, bad for production. Number three, our distribution is highly dependent on a low number of uh, big hubs where a majority of our garments and products are going through. Uh, it has a massive impact if uh, one of these hubs would uh, be impacted uh, by increased sea level or similar. And this work was of course done before COVID, but now we also have some kind of live test of uh, how this scenario actually played out. Last, uh, definitely not least, is of course customer behavior. We know that our customers are becoming more and more aware and we will just, or they will just increase their demands on companies such as ours. And the question is not uh, if it will happen, the question is how quick will this transition be? And will we be in front of our customers receiving them or will we chase after them? Next. So I will just quickly uh, go through the main areas of challenges for us in the transition away from fossil fuel. Next. Energy efficiency is, uh, of course, interesting for all industries and must, is something that we must continue to work with. Uh, this area contains a lot of what we call low-hanging fruit. Activities and projects that has been quite rapid return of investment and things that the suppliers directly will save money on making it possible also, uh, if done correctly, to keep uh, the consumer's pricing at the same level. Boiler, similar to this in, this, in, the, in the picture here, is the single biggest source of emission in our value chain. And it, it is, of course, scope three, and it's also most common in our tier two. So we have a very low power of impact towards this. But, um, um, it's uh, still our biggest source of emission. Uh, we must support our suppliers here with expertise, system, system support, and also we must uh, set up financial solutions for them. Next. Electricity from renewable sources will be one of the most challenging part of the global transition uh, overall, away from fossil fuels. Uh, for most companies, I would say. We have a responsibility as a big company to lead our industry and society in a pace that others cannot. And again, the financial parts will be key to our success or failure in this area. Next one. Fuels are used everywhere within our industry, both for generating steam, and, but also a, a big part is used for creating on-site electricity uh, due to uh, uh, many outages in the grid, uh, due to high um, uh, high uh, trustworthiness or a high, um, um, what I'm saying is uh, coal and natural gas is uh, very uh, reliant. That was the word I was looking for, sorry. Uh, so here, big investments are needed, capex investments, and uh, we need to change the technology and improve the technology uh, in a way to support our suppliers to get away from this technology. Next one. Our efforts within public affairs will also continue to increase because we are seeing that what we're doing in this area is, is working. Uh, it is extremely difficult to measure our impact uh, in this area. And uh, it's uh, very difficult also to, to uh, measure how or, or when uh, it's specifically our commitment that has made politicians to change their mind. But it doesn't matter. We also see it, it's quite cheap to do um, um, activities within this area and get a big result, especially together with other competitors. And uh, I would say the most important part here is that we need to be uh, standing up against the fossil fuel lobbies that has a, man, a long, long uh, experience uh, from doing this, while the textile industry uh, has been historically quite bad at doing that. So we need to stand up against them and we need to learn quickly. Next one. Logistics is a part of our value chain where we have quite good measurements and possibilities to actively impact and choose, especially when we talk about last mile delivery, uh, which is the part that our customers are seeing. So there we're, we're, uh, we have a local uh, 
solutions depending on what country it is that is differently uh, green or sustainable for uh, for offers for offering the customers and of course we're also doing more overall uh, changing like developing new and improved fuels together with the giants such as Maersk. Next one. Thirteen percent of our emissions we report uh, is coming from the customer's electricity usage and as you understand these calculations are fully based on estimates and guesses and we will strongly need to improve them over time. However we also need to work closely to our uh, customers and making or supporting their transition to a 100% renewable electricity future in their homes. And this is about awareness raising and it's also a great opportunity for us to connect uh, one more time and in a different area with the customers, building a stronger relationship uh, with them. Next one. Uh, okay, so when we talk about uh, we know that the population of the world will continue to grow and by that fact the economy will continue to grow what cannot be continue to grow is of course the use of resources and virgin resources so we need to decouple this and we need to get into a fully circular uh, business model uh, and stop using as i said we need to stop using virgin material overall next one so to round this up, our main challenges, the quality and the access to credible data is insufficient. We will for years to come be dependent on estimates based on estimates and guesses and reaching some, something similar to live data right now seems impossible or, or very far-fetched. So that's, some, that's an area where we really need to put a lot of effort and resources in. Second one is that we search for, uh, or we are going to create new types of financing models to help or to support uh, the transition within our supply chain. Uh, companies normally finance their own operations, their own investments, but how can we use our size here and our credit, um, um, our high credit rating? How can we find solutions that suits in, in different regions and how can we get a very quick start of our uh, supply chain? And of course, we, we will focus mainly where the biggest um, uh, emission sources are coming from so that we can see uh, impact change from within maybe two or three years from now which is which is ambitious but that's where we're aiming and uh, uh, the third thing is that um, we 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 have to find um, or or when we have done this extensive work we have gotten so many ideas and so much input from all our different regions and externally and internally so that it has now become a problem for us on how to prioritize this so we need to be able to again measure where will one dollar make most sense for the climate will it be uh, in bangladesh and, and focusing on boilers or will it be in us focusing on a, on a store we need to get a, a global understanding of where the resources will be used uh, in in the best way and that's we didn't see that as a challenge one year ago now it is a big challenge for us last but not least we need to find ways to change or to work around the current policies of many governments that does not have a um, positive in enough positive attitude when it comes to renewable energy next so that was it for me so i will close my camera thank you so much thanks a lot um for this very inspiring presentation um a quick follow-up from my side uh would be before we go to the uh, general uh, Q&A question would be um, you mentioned like several challenges and possible risk areas uh, I was wondering often the challenge with climate risk is the time scales right some of them are only kind of emerging in 10 to 20 or in 30 years are there any examples that you could think of where you already be kind of impacted by by certain climate risks would you and could you give some of them 
Is there any? Uh, well, I would see the I would say the strongest uh, example of clear climate related risk is the production in in these areas that I mentioned, where where uh, where workers are having difficulties even getting to work because it's 50 degrees, and uh, mm -hmm. then uh, there's no real um, there's uh, most often not any um, air condition in their facilities making it very difficult for them to stay hydrated for a full day of work uh, and that uh, also in those areas are also experiencing uh, climate uh, how do you say climate refugees when when people just can't live there anymore and they are moving and of course as long as the movement is within the same country i guess it's it's a fine, but um, uh, we foresee a future where, where people will start uh, crossing borders and, and normally that's a very bad thing for business. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting to see that here it's even the physical risks that may be impacting already, uh, where sometimes people more thinking of the transition risk or the more yeah for sure and i mean then, then we have if, if you just have a more uh, a more regional aspect of it uh, we uh, we often have to close stores in certain regions we are in 74 markets and it doesn't it might not impact our full business but uh, let's for example in us and the and the the storms that are hitting there we have to close all uh, full regions uh, uh, on an from now and then Yep. Yep, thanks a lot. Yeah, I think with that we can uh, continue with uh, opening uh, up the discussion, going in the a general Q and A session. So uh, maybe one thing here: um, we just had the pool before where we ask you. Is there a role for for the Nordic governments in standardizing uh, climate risk assessments and uh, it would be nice if Marie, you can quickly bring back the, the results of the poll. Possible, yeah, perfect. So thank you. Thanks a lot. I think the the, the answer was kind of overwhelmingly yes. <laughs> there is a role for Nordic governments to streamline standardized climate risk assessments. Um, and I think for me, it would be interesting to also get the views of um, the other two speakers. Um, so Kim and Johanna, how do you see see that? Could you, in your assessment you already have done, did you, did you experience at some point in time, yeah, that would be really a help, some some in terms of standardization or in terms of of, of data provided or or anything similar? Could you could you think of a of a case where the Nordic governments could support you in your endeavor on, on climate risk and opportunities? I, I can just answer more generally. I, I, I mean, there, there is a big lack of, uh, um, of, of uh, global standards and global uh, uh, assessments or way of communicating. And I, that is slowing us down, I would say. Um, so it would, of course, be great if uh, the Nordic could be role models here. Um, but I, I, I think it needs to be the next step also needs to be uh, including EU and, and global level. Yep, I, I, I fully agree with Kim as well. And I, I think the role for the Nordic governments would be to kind of create a sort of more standardized approach for kind of how you manage the climate risk data and how you communicate the climate risk uh, related topics because there's still a huge variety how the organizations kind of uh, well communicate uh, communicate and how they use the data and and how is it measured so definitely some standard structure would be very good yeah. thanks is this something that you that you could also support Mati from a more kind of general perspective i could imagine there's always this trade-off right because every company of course has their kind of own scenarios and own ways of assessing and at the same time i totally agree with you if everybody reports something different it's also very difficult to compare and and under, get a better understanding what's the the view from from your side on this also so having the contact to different smes so maybe i would be happy to have some more standardization right because they don't have the capacity or um, money behind to just do that, such a big assessment themselves. 
Yes, definitely. I think well, there are <laughs> multiple viewpoints. I think, well, first of all, our members of Finance Finland, which rep represents the financial sector here in Finland, they have actually proposed a, a common EU-wide like a sort of a data register which could then utilize from the finance industry's perspective in 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 uh, assessing ESG data and, and data that is that is being provided by companies um, I think I mean I was involved in, in the discussions in the run-up to when the TCFD framework was created so it was done by the industry for the industry so I think and as I mentioned, that I'm one of the findings from our report is that, I mean, from the framework, this, the actual reporting that you do and the actual data you analyze, it's, it's very much much dependent on on the sector involved. So you would have to sort of combine this standardization with the with the flexibility that is that is needed. And, and we're, for example, now with the EU taxonomy and the sustainable finance discussions, we are, I'm sort of seeing a mismatch between, for example, what the financial sector expecting from companies and then what companies are saying that what, what is actually material, what can they say about mm -hmm. scenarios and futures and, 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 and the risks that and opportunities that are going to be happened so i think there's definitely room for for harmonization and standardization <laughs> but i also i also see the the sort of um a sort of different expectations from coming from those who supply the data or the information and those who use it and then especially if you're talking about the industries uh which are in manufacturing and then then the financial sector which is sort of looking at the, the financial that data and, and trying to sort of understand the material impact of, of 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 what will happen with climate change with with regard to different uh companies so a bit of a an either or answer but i think <laughs> definitely definitely room for for improvements but this flexibility issue is also i think something that needs to be considered yes thank you um then maybe looking at, at at questions that um came a bit from from the audience um and this is a question a bit going into the direction um kind of com maybe comparing a bit um what you already said a bit kim that that covid 19 was somehow some test if you can say a test run for, for some of the scenarios, for example, if the supply chains are completely interrupted. Um, and here was a bit the question, uh, when companies uh, kind of have the responsibility to pay carbon tax, but also, of course, um, commit to achieve the EU targets uh, by 2035, 2015, with developing new technologies, um, kind of having this pressure on, on uh, due to these things. And then there's also, now the economic hit due to due to COVID-19 impacts. Um, how do you see is this, is it? Yeah, how do you see this, these two things uh, kind of um, interacting? Is it a problem? Does it kind of push push certain efforts backwards um, in terms of of what you're implementing, or is it more like even strengthening maybe your your commitment to uh, to address certain risks? I think uh, looking at it short term, uh, it definitely halted a lot of the work that was ongoing or paused uh, the, the, the work that was ongoing in many parts of, of our organization. However, looking at it more now when we, we feel that we have not control, but at least we have a better understanding of, of how it impacts uh, us, I think the the building back better as many are, are, are talking about that's something that we will really really enhance within the the company and our new ceo is really taking this as an opportunity to really change how uh, how the story is communicated what and then i mean internally um, like uh, uh, i i do hope uh, that we're going to change most of our uh, in, way of doing business basically and especially in how we produce uh, so i think long term it might have been okay if, if that's a good answer but uh, 
short term there was chaos there was anxiety we were scared um, and we started pulling in every string of course because we didn't sell anything but now when we we're, when we're kind of getting back to business we will definitely try to do it much better and in a, in a different way so long term it might be um, if not uh, positive at least neutral I don't know, any thoughts on it, Johanna or, or Mati, or? No, well, I, I, I very much agree with, with Kim what, on what's been said. I think for many of our members in different sectors, whether it be the, um, the energy sector or, or the commerce and retail sector, for example, I, I think a lot of companies have been saying that this was sort of a things that they were projecting that would happen five years into the future so the role of the share of renewable energy for example in the electricity grid or the share of 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 e-commerce in in for example in food and grocery sector is something that they say would happen in five years actually happened now this year so that's sort of a, a glimpse into the future on what happened uh, for many of our, our business sectors uh, i think the, the crisis has strengthened their resolve in in looking at low carbon pathways and really looking at the opportunities that knowing that this is going to be the way that's been strengthened by the fact that at, at least in Europe there is this very strong consensus on on green recovery on building back better better and putting a lot of the stimulus money on money on on really making sure that we have this green digital transformation going on when we we build our economies back but for a, I mean, I have to say that also for a lot of industries, this is creating a lot, a very difficult situation. If you look at tourism and, and airlines, nobody really knows what's going to happen, whether it be that this will be, uh, we will have a stagnant growth or no growth for five years. The IEA is now talking about the baby, the behavioral shifts actually affecting that growth, that the, the growth of airlines will never going to is never going to happen because companies will change the way that they they're going to think about their business flights and so on. So, I think for many sectors it's very clear and this has strengthened the result. But there are also quite a lot of sectors which you really don't know what's actually going to happen and it's really difficult to say that for, with certainty that what what is going to happen, what is going to be the the, the the future of, of, of a lot of, of a lot of industries and I'm, I'm seeing this also from from the feedback that we get from our members so some have bounced back already are growing some are really I mean minus 90 percent for example with the airlines and and the tourism industry it's still it's it's completely paralyzed thank you you may if and following on on that I think one one thing would be nice um, also coming more towards the closure of, of this webinar will be just to get one more idea on, on the people that are in in the call right now would be um, to get a bit of an idea on did you already experience um, impact uh, on your business due to climate related risks. So I think it would be nice to, to get your feedback here and, and uh, we would do another quick poll uh, on this issue. So give you some seconds to to provide some answers here. And I think when when we got the feedback from uh, our audience, I will give the question also back to uh, maybe to Johanna. In, in terms of the, uh, if you experienced such a direct impact already, or if it is still more an exercise in terms of looking into the future in the next five to 10 to 15 years? Well, definitely uh, the climate change is affecting our business and it's, it's part of how we operate like every day. And if you look at our annual statement and the kind of principal uncertainties, you can see that it is like in a different way, either directly or indirectly affecting a different elements of our principal uncertainty, whether it is the scarcity of the raw materials, of the use of the raw materials, how we build our supply chain, 
what are our consumers expecting from us in terms of climate change even our like uh, probably like the key risk for us is the weather and seasonality because the climate changes of course could be prolonging like unfavorable weather conditions because definitely our certain product portfolio is sold during the snowy winters if there's no snow direct impact yeah. <laughs> and gardening equipment if there's a really rainy spring who wants to buy like a kind of like a watering equipment that there's no need so yeah. definitely a direct impact yeah thank you and i think it's it's in also in line with what we got to back from from our from our audience which is like a kind of 40 percent saying yes and 40 percent are a bit unsure but only like 20 percent with a clear no on this answer so and i agree i think what we also see when we work with companies sometimes it's that it's uh, where i would kind of see this unsure is coming from is it's not sometimes not clear right what is climate change what is general impacts of of uh of the climate that is any way that you have always have right it's always something it's sometimes difficult to to separate and it's not even clear if you need to separate it or not um going in the same direction it's what uh, kim also mentioned before is on the terms of how do you measure these different things and what measures do you need do you use to to quantify these impacts um wondering if there is a, a question from from Anna, um, or if there's any other questions from the audience to the speakers. So it seems no more question from Anna, no. Um, and no more questions, I think, so far from the audience um so i think with that we are almost uh, at the end four minutes early but i think that's that's fine giving the people the possibility to brief uh, before the next <laughs> virtual meeting is going on um yeah Anna, so uh, handing back to you for for uh, saying goodbye yes uh yeah thank you all for being here today and listening to this webinar and thank you all uh, speakers for uh, your great presentations and and Nico for asking great questions and of course for the questions we got from the audience as well. And if you have any questions to ask regarding climate risks, you are always free to contact me or Nico or anyone else at Thoughtful as well. And yeah, I wish you a great afternoon. And yeah, thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.